perhaps we might begin, Golding, by um, talking for a minute or two at any rate about uh, an article uh, on your work, which I know you liked, by John Peter, which appeared in the Kenyan Review about a year ago, in which he says many admiring things about all your books, but introduces a, a distinction between fable and fiction and puts you very much on the fable side, arguing, for example, that um, uh, in Lord of the Flies you, you incline occasionally not to give a sort of full-bodied presentation of people uh, living and behaving so much as an illustration of a particular theme. Uh, would you accept this as a fair comment on your work? Well, what I re would regard as a tremendous compliment to myself would be if someone would substitute the word myth for fable, because yes. I think a myth is a much profounder and more significant thing than a fable. I think, now perhaps this is merely, a, a, again, one of those semantic puzzles that we hear about, but I do feel fable as being an invented thing on the surface, whereas myth is something which comes out from the roots of things, possibly in the, in, in, in just in the Jungian sense, possibly in the ancient sense of being the key to, to existence, the whole meaning, uh, meaning of life and experience uh, as a whole. Or indeed a total explanation of a certain human situation. Total explanation of a certain human situation, yes. Um, but if we can grant for the <coughs> moment some kind of, of, of nexus between fable and myth, yes, I, th I, I think I do tend to think in terms of the fabulous in that sense rather than in the immediate human situation. Yes, you're, you're not primarily interested in, in giving the, uh, the sort of body and pressure of, of lived life in a wide society. Obviously not, because all your books, the three, the, the three novels that you've published so far, have all been concerned with uh, uh, either persons or societies unnaturally isolated in, in some sense. Or perhaps unnaturally is not the right word here. But in Lord of the Flies, your boys are dropped onto a desert island. So, um, I, I, is it legitimate to assume from that, that that you are concerned with people in this kind of ex extremity of solitariness? Well, no, I don't. I don't think it is legitimate. My own feeling about it is that their their isolation is a convenient one rather than an unnatural one. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I do see, but I'm not sure about the word convenient here. Uh, convenient to you, because you want to treat boys in the absence of grown-ups. Is, mm. is this what you mean? Uh, yes, I suppose so, but you see, um, it depends how far you, 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 you regard intentions as being readable. Now, you know about teaching people, and I know about teaching people. We both do it as our, as our daily bread. Well, you see perhaps people who are not quite as immature as those I see. But my own immature boys that I see, I watch them carefully, and there does come a point which is very legible in, in, in their society, at which you can see all these things are within a second of being carried out. It's the master who gets the right boy by the scruff of the neck and hauls him back. Yes. See, he is God who stops a murder being committed. Yes, and th this is why one of your boys, um, um, Piggy, often refers to the absence of grown-ups hmm? as, as the most important conditioning yes, yes, factor yes, in the yes, situation. Yes. The argument is then um, that out of a human group of this kind, um, the human invention, I, I, I hope this is not loading you too heavily, the human invention of evil will proceed provided that certain quite arbitrary checks are not present. Yes, I think so. I think that the arbitrary checks that you talk about are nothing but the fruit of bitter experience of people who are adult enough to realize, well, I, I myself am vicious and would like to kill that man, and he is vicious and would like to kill me, and therefore it is sensible 
that we should both have an arbitrary scheme of things in which three other people will come in and separate us. And, and this makes it interesting, I think, to consider the place among your boys of the, the boy Simon in Lord of the Flies, who um, is different from the others, and who understands something like the situation that you're describing. He understands, for example, that the uh, evil that the boys fear, the beast they fear, is substantially of their own invention. But when, in fact, he announces this, he himself is regarded as the evil and killed accordingly. Mm -hmm. are, we to, are we allowed to infer f from your myth that there will always be a person of that order in a, a, a group? Or is this, this too, too much? It, 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 it's, I think, a bit unfair, not so much because it isn't germane, but simply because it brings up too much. You see, um, I think, on the one hand, that it is true there will always be people who will see something particularly clearly and will not be listened to, and if they are particularly outstanding examples of their sort, will probably be killed for it. Yes. But on the other hand, that in itself brings up such a vast kind of panorama of existence. You will see, I mean, is it, are we bringing God in now? You will see, well, can we bring him into the third program or, or not? Well, we'd have to eventually, yes. I think. Well, well, <laughs> well he, he, he jumps in at this point, doesn't he, you see? Because what Simon is and what so many people, and now this is interesting, what so many intelligent people, and particularly, if I may say so, so, so many literary people find is that Simon is incomprehensible. But he is comprehensible to the illiterate person. The illiterate person knows about saints and sanctity, and Simon is a saint. Yes, well, he's a kind of scapegoat, I suppose. No, I, I won't yeah. agree. I won't no. agree in the least. Uh, you're, 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 no, you, you, are, you are really flapping a kind of, uh, of golden bow over me, aren't you? Or waving it over my head. I don't agree. You see, a saint, is, a saint isn't just a scapegoat. A saint is somebody who, in the last analysis, voluntarily embraces his fate, which is a pretty sticky one. And he is, for the illiterate, a proof of the existence of God, because the illiterate person who is not brought up on logic and not brought up always to hope for the worst, and says, well, a person like this cannot exist without a good God, you see? And therefore the illiterate person finds Simon extremely easy to understand. Someone who voluntarily embraces this beast, goes and tries to get rid of him, and goes to give the good news to the ordinary bestial man yes. on the beach yes. and gets killed for it. Yes, but now may I introduce the, um, the famous Lawrence caveat here, never trust the teller, trust the tale. What in oh, fact, that's absolute nonsense. It's nonsense. It's absolute <laughs> nonsense. I've never heard anything, well, yes, I've heard even sillier <laughs> remarks, but of course, the man who tells the tale, if he has a tale worth telling, will know exactly what he is about. And this this business of the, of the artist as a sort of starry-eyed, inspired creature dancing along with his feet two or three feet above the surface of the earth, not really knowing what sort of prints he's leaving behind him, is just, well, it's nothing like the truth.